15. Thank you so much for having me. It's lovely, lovely to be back at 5 by 15. So nice to be here. The terrifying egg timer of doom. Um, I imagine that most of you have probably already seen the flood of recent stories in the press. Um, the outpouring of testimony that started with Harvey Weinstein in Hollywood, that then gave rise to allegations about Westminster and Parliament and beyond. Um, I'm not going to spend too long going through it, um, because most of it you'll already have read about and been aware of. What I really want to talk about is the response and the reaction. Um, in particular, this whole story which has gripped us, which has been in the public eye now for weeks, the news cycle has just run and run and run, it's given rise to a lot of questions, many stupid questions. Um, I, I don't know how many times, I, I think perhaps 16 or 17 times I was asked to go on a radio or a television programme to talk about this burning question that seemed to be genuinely the most important question that anyone in the media could think of to ask about this issue. After these swathes of stories, after these millions of women coming forward to describe their rape and assault and abuse, where's the line though? Where's the line between flirting and sexual harassment? That was the question. As if to suggest that the vast majority of these instances might have been misunderstandings. As if to suggest, really insultingly, that the vast majority of men are out there bumbling around accidentally sexually assaulting people all the time. As if the vast majority of people don't know where the line is. As if there weren't a very clear difference between a compliment or a kind word or a conversation and shouting tits at a woman across the office or in a passing car. What's really interesting is that while this story, this outpouring of stories has given rise to so many questions, there's one place where we haven't seen any questions at all. We've seen almost no questions at all asked of the men. I don't know if anyone's noticed this. We have asked so many questions of the women, so many questions about victims, about survivors. Did she imagine it? Was she overreacting? Why didn't she do this? Why didn't she do that? But so few questions has anybody, I haven't seen anywhere anybody ask, not once, why did he do it? How did he get away with it? Why didn't he or he or he or he or he say something, stop something, step in? 30 years, decades, decades this went on, dozens of women experiencing it. And what's fascinating, when you look at what these men in the public eye have said after having um, had these allegations made, is that these powerful men all had very powerful excuses, and these excuses largely have been swallowed and accepted. So we've had Harvey Weinstein telling us that he's seeking treatment for sex addiction, as if to suggest that this is some kind of an illness that he had no control over, as if to suggest that the deliberate abuse of power over people in a position far subordinate to him was somehow directly connected to sex and attraction rather than being a crime, rather than being something that was about power. We had Michael Fallon suggesting that this behaviour was acceptable a decade ago, as if it was absolutely fine, as if the women who were assaulted and abused and harassed a decade ago were saying, yes, that's wonderful, please do carry on, as if it was absolutely okay, rather than sort of realising that actually this has never been okay, that he, we've always all known that this isn't something that's okay, but that just now we're starting to begin to talk about it. Mark Garnier suggesting it wasn't sexual harassment, it was hijinks. If anyone doesn't know, this is the MP who asked his secretary to go and buy sex toys but it's okay because it wasn't sexual harassment it was just hijinks these kind of euphemisms these excuses these reasons um, Kevin Spacey who tried to deflect attention from allegations that he had assaulted uh, an underage actor um, by coming out in the statement in which he addressed the allegations um, which somebody on Twitter compared to somebody saying um, oh yes actually um, I did burn down that house but let me tell you I'm a fly fisherman you know, just this kind of unbelievable deflection and, and also obviously incredibly unhelpful kind of muddying of the waters um, around paedophilia as well. And Louis C.K., after allegations of sexual harassment coming out, saying, I used to misread people back then, as if to suggest, well, you know, these women were asking for it just a little bit. They, they suggested things. They, you know, sent misleading signals. It wasn't really my fault. So again and again and again, we've seen these powerful men, finally um, women coming out and feeling able to report what had happened to them. 
And yet, by and large, we've accepted these powerful men's powerful excuses, and so they slip out of the picture. And then the real questions begin. <clears throat> um, was she making it up? Wasn't it just a compliment? Didn't it, in the end, advance her career? Didn't she probably quite enjoy it? Didn't she just need to lighten up? Is she overreacting? Perhaps she imagined it. And what we've seen in the last few weeks is women in their millions coming forward to say, no, no, I wasn't overreacting. No, I didn't imagine it. No, it wasn't a compliment. No, it didn't help my career. And thousands and thousands of other women standing behind them saying, and it happened to me too. This is a, um, a hashtag, Me Too, a campaign that was originally started by an activist called Tarana Burke, um, who originally started it with the aim of helping women of colour to speak out about their experiences of sexual harassment and assault, which in itself tells us something about the problem, that it's only when this issue has been popularised by white Hollywood actresses that suddenly we're quite interested, that suddenly there's a spotlight on it. I don't know if anybody saw the incredibly powerful open letter that was penned um, by farm workers, by thousands of women um, who work in an area very far from Hollywood without that kind of spotlight and glitz and glamour standing behind Hollywood actresses and saying, us too, we experience this kind of harassment and abuse at work on a daily basis. And again, their stories have garnered far less interest and support, which tells us something about the problem in itself. But 12 million women came forward, and so we started to learn things. We started to learn something about the scale of the problem. In particular, we learned that sexual violence is endemic in the workplace. In fact, just last year, we did a YouGov survey about this, the Everyday Sexism Project and the TUC, and found that still, even in 2017, two-thirds of young women and over half of all women experience sexual harassment in the workplace. We found that actually one-eighth had experienced unwanted sexual touching or attempts to kiss them. In other words, that an eighth of women in the workplace in the UK are experiencing sexual assault inside the workplace during the course of their career. Um, we found that a huge number of women had changed jobs as a result, that they adopted coping mechanisms, that they tried everything to deal with this. And we found that an overwhelming 80% didn't feel able to come forward and report what had happened to them. What's interesting for me, I think, even more than that, is the very small number who did, when we asked them what happened as a result, three quarters said that nothing changed, and another 16% said that actually they were treated worse as a result. So we learn about the problem. We learn about the ways in which it's impacting on women, particularly low-paid women, women on zero-hours contracts, women also experiencing homophobia, transphobia, racism in the workplace. And in particular, with this outp outpouring of stories, we learned that it was something that affects all workplaces. This is a, an amazing, very moving picture from the European Parliament, where in the middle of a debate, um, some members of the European Parliament put Me Too and Mo Si signs on their desks as a way of joining in. Um, this really is something that's happening everywhere. It really is something that's impacting on women particularly, but also men and boys. And so for me, um, given that this is the area in which I work, given that I've dedicated my career so far to trying to raise awareness of the sheer extent of this problem, trying to force people to acknowledge that it does still happening, that it is impacting on women's lives on a daily basis, this was an incredible moment. There was this possibility in the air. People started talking about a tipping point. There seemed to be this great moment of possibility that perhaps now we'll take it seriously. Perhaps this is it. Perhaps this is the moment that people realize. Perhaps this is the moment that people start listening to women. Perhaps this is the moment where we move forward from the endless debate about is this still a problem? Does it really exist? Aren't women making a fuss about nothing? And on to the debate of what do we do about it? Of course it's a problem. What happens next? And it's hard to describe how it felt to watch that moment of possibility being trampled by the backlash and the response. Again and again and again to get those requests. Can you come on? We want to talk about this issue that's in the media. Yes, fantastic. What are we going to talk about? Are we going to talk about these 12 million stories? Are we going to talk about rape in the workplace? Are we going to talk about what kind of laws need to be strengthened, about reporting procedures? No, we thought it would be great to have a discussion about whether, you know, it's 
scary for men to touch a woman on the elbow anymore in case they get the wrong idea. Again and again and again. To give you an idea, I got an email that came through from a very well-known television program asking me to go on and talk about this issue after 12 million women had come forward with their stories of rape and assault and abuse. And they wanted to do it as a debate. And the subject line of the email was, has feminism gone too far? And it's hard to explain how heartbreaking it's been because of this huge sense of maybe this is it, maybe this is the moment. And it's hard to explain how it's felt, the kind of gut punch of seeing the response of the media to this without really setting it out side by side, day after day, what happened. And so I'm going to show you, I'm going to take you through it because it just came question after question after question, and after the men slipped out of the frame, all the questions were asked of women. It started with, has feminism gone too far? Then all of these other questions, didn't she really enjoy it? Wasn't she really asking for it? Didn't she do it to advance her career? Aren't they making it up? Aren't they making a fuss about nothing? And then one question, more than any other, that surely anybody who's glanced at the front pages or listened to anything on the radio over the last few weeks will have heard over and over again. The question I've heard, the most common question to come out of all of this over and over again. Why don't women come forward? Why didn't she report it sooner? Why didn't she say something at the time? And it's that question that I'm going to try and answer tonight. So this is how it started. The story started coming out. Women started coming forward, incredibly brave women share, sharing stories that they'd kept silent about for decades because of pressure, because of shame, because of the fear of their careers being damaged as a result, because they thought they'd be blacklisted within the industry. Or even, and something that's been completely overlooked in all of this, women who had come forward, who did talk about this years ago and were silenced and found people turning a blind eye and a cold shoulder. Women who had their projects abandoned by big studios because they dared to try and speak out at the time. And so it started with the sex scandal, the discussion of this as sex, as something that was about uh, attraction, as something that was all about attractive women being in the wrong place at the wrong time, wearing the wrong thing, catching the wrong kind of eye of the wrong kind of men. And as soon as you use that word sex scandal, it becomes titillating, it becomes something exciting and dramatic. The idea of something kind of consensual is in there underneath, and it moves away from abuse and assault, from abuse of power, from deliberate criminal acts. It moves away from the idea that these were so very often and are so very often powerful men, powerful older men, often powerful older married men, taking advantage of situations in which it is absolutely crystal clear that the sub subordinate woman, often decades their junior, has absolutely no interest in the sexual advances that are being pressed upon them unwanted. But as soon as we say sex scandal, there's that kind of frisson and it goes back to that idea of bumbling men and, you know, perhaps he thought that she would want it. And then, of course, they monster and other the perpetrators. So they call him beast. They call him monster. They suggest that there is something incredibly unusual and other about this man acting in this way. And, of course, what that suggests is that this isn't common. This isn't something that's happening in most places. They diminish the issue. This was Newsnight, Newsnight, BBC Newsnight, talking about animals with a backdrop of rutting zebras. It's on iPlayer. You can go back and use it. These are direct quotes. If someone drops something and I have to tell them if I touch them, am I committing sexual harassment? Do you ask permission to put your hand on somebody's shoulder or touch their elbow? And at the top of the program where they asked these questions, they'd asked three women to share their stories. They had three women, one describing her rape, incredibly traumatic, crying, breaking down as she described it, one describing being assaulted on public transport and one describing domestic abuse. And then this is how they discussed the issue. This is what they reduced it to. They reported the sexual violence alongside sexual objectification, just to muddy those waters a little bit further, just to make sure that it stayed as titillating as possible. They feared for the perpetrators. On the Today program, again and again, they asked, is this a witch hunt? You know, will it be gone going too far after decades and decades of thousands of men getting away with this behavior? A few women have come forward. What will happen to the poor men? There are risks in this, aren't there? We're heading in that direction, aren't they, where MPs will be terribly nervous about asking somebody for a date. It's actually incredible when you think that this is the response to 12 million people coming out with their stories and experiences. And of course, individual women are shamed and blamed and ripped down just to remind the rest of us of what will happen if we dare to put our heads about the above the parapet. 
one woman who had reported allegations, this is how she was treated to a fantastic double-page spread in the Daily Mail. Victims were accused of complicity. I went to talk about this on The Moral Maze and was asked, didn't these young actors play along with it? They were going into Hollywood. Shouldn't they have known what it was that they were walking into? Would they really be surprised by this? And you have to stop constantly with this and remember what we're talking about. Would they really be surprised for someone to have attempted to rape them? Didn't they go along with it? Didn't they want it to advance their career? It's quite extraordinary, these headlines, these front pages, stop shaming men, stop destroying men. It's not really sexual harassment, it's not really a sexual assault. An article in the Times by Giles Corrin suggesting that putting a kiss on the end of an email might ruin his career. These are direct quotes. Time to stop being charming to waitresses. Time to stop trying to make women laugh. And again, you just have to stop and remember that we're talking about rape and assault and harassment. He said, one misfired flirt and I could be out of a job, publicly shunned, end up in prison. The women are out there who could make it happen. The historical crimes, real or imagined, are waiting to tumble upon one wrong move. And to be fair, you know, he's right because all of these men whose careers are completely ruined by allegations of sexual harassment and assault, you know, just ask Woody Allen or Roman Polanski or Chris Rock or R. Kelly or, of course, Donald Trump, whose career has been desperately affected by the dozens of women who have accused him of sexual harassment and assault, never mind that he admitted it on tape. It's just extraordinary, this response. It's the most incredible attempt to silence victims, this moment of speaking out, this moment of possibility. And of course, in the end, in a storm of vitriolic bile, it reaches its logical victim-blaming, misogynistic, and even Islamophobic conclusion. And this kind of sums it all up, I think. And they ask, why don't women come forward?